All right, well, uh, it's about time, so uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, my name is uh, Steve Newman. I'm the founder and CEO at Scalar. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about how uh, modern uh, application uh, architectures and development practices um, have been putting a lot more pressure on operational visibility. Um, how we can look at operational visibility uh, effectively as a, a big data problem, although uh, with some uh, interesting and unique aspects. And, um, and then I'll wrap up with some uh, fun engineering challenges uh, that, that we've been tackling here at Scalar um, to kind of address that, that big data problem. So uh, at the heart of all of this, um, you know, a lot of modern, modern uh, practices, uh, the cloud, you know, tools and, and platforms and things like the cloud and Kubernetes and microservices and, and serverless functions as a service, all of these things abstract away a lot of the work that uh, previously were necessary to, to run an application, a website, what have you. Um, and there's, uh, of course, a lot of value in that. But um, you know, problems that, that get uh, pushed down in one place have, have a way of, of sneaking back in another. Uh, and, that, and that's going to be a, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. So um, just for a little perspective, uh, imagine uh, you're running some kind of a, an e-commerce site, maybe you know in the late '90s during the original uh, you know web 1.0.com boom. Um, so the you know it might not have been hugely complex. Uh, you know maybe you'd have you know a dozen components to the, the system you're you're, you're running. Uh, you know a web server, uh, probably a MySQL database, uh, some kind of payment gateway, an email server, and so forth. Um, but you're investing a lot of work into each one of these components, uh, probably up to and including you know, literally going in person physically into a data center and, and racking servers, as well as deploying the software in it. You know, everything about those components uh, your team is, is doing themselves. Uh, fast forward uh, a decade or two, uh, and the picture looks very different. Um, you know, there's a, there are much higher level services available. Instead of you know, building your own payment gateway, you can use a service like Stripe. Uh, you're certainly not racking your own, your own servers. Uh, 99 times out of 100, you're, you're getting them from a cloud provider. Uh, you know, you can uh, have a, a database service instead of installing your own database somewhere. Um, so, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of that work has been abstracted away. But it's interesting to, to keep in mind that the number of components in your system hasn't gone down. In fact, it's probably increased. Um, it's just that a lot of it is now hiding behind an abstraction boundary uh, where you don't have to worry about it as directly. And we tend to take that savings, uh, the, you know, the work that we're getting back, and reinvest it in more complex, more sophisticated applications. Um, so you know, we're not generally you know, using smaller engineering teams. We're not all just kicking back. Um, you know, there's a tendency, as, as the tools get better and the architectures get uh, improved, um, to take that savings and you know, you know, there's always pressure to then add you know, one more feature, one more piece of complexity, one more component to the system until you're back at the, the balancing point, which more or less by definition is where the engineering team is, is you know, approaching the breaking point. Um, and you know, a lot of these uh, you know, new tools and platforms um, at, at heart are better ways of, of building distributed systems or levers that allow us to build uh, kind of larger distributed systems. It uh, puts me in mind of a quote from uh, the computer scientist Leslie Lampert uh, way back in the, the early days of 1987. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. And um, we had a, a interesting example of this uh, in, in my own history. So. Um, uh, so in a previous life, uh, I co-founded a startup called Rightly. Uh, we were acquired by Google and became part of Google Docs. And shortly after the acquisition, um, or, or shortly after we relaunched as Docs, uh, we had a 20-minute uh, outage because it was halftime in the World Cup and Brazil was playing. And everyone in Brazil at halftime rushed to their computer to log on to their favorite social network and gossip about the game. And if it's 2006 and you're in Brazil, your social network is Orkut. And um, the resulting flood of traffic overwhelmed the, oh, and Orkut, uh, by the way, uh, for the probably many of you who don't remember, um, was a Google property. Uh, and the, the resulting flood of traffic uh, over, completely overloaded 
the network in the data center where ORCID was running, uh, which uh, I happen to know was also the data center where uh, Docs was running at that time, uh, and there was just nothing to beat them. We were, we were down until, um, until halftime ended, uh, at which point we, um, uh, we frantically mo uh, flipped out of that data center into our backup data center, which unfortunately we weren't able to do until we had the connectivity back. Um, but the, you know, I have fun telling this story just because it's just such an absurd example of, you know, a butterfly flapping its wings and, you know, knocking, knocking a service down. But, um, you know, it wasn't much fun at the time. Uh, you know, Mark Twain said uh, tragedy or humor is tragedy plus time. And uh, so, you know, this is a fun story for me now. But it's, you know, it's also, I think, you know, just a great example of how as systems get more sophisticated and more complex and more interconnected, uh, it, it creates more and more places for problems to sneak in. And um, so, you know, kind of, you know, taking a look at the big picture, um, you know, all these modern architectural trends, again, you know, cloud and Kubernetes and so forth, um, they're allowing us to build more and more complex and sophisticated applications. Uh, meanwhile, uh, techniques like agile development and CI, CD and so forth, uh, are increasing the velocity at, at which we can uh, evolve these applications. Um, and, one, and, and this creates a, a classic pick two trade-off, uh, in this case against quality. Uh, and by quality, I mean uh, you know, that can manifest as, as downtime, as, as bugs, as performance problems. Uh, but in general, you know, a, a more sophisticated, fast-moving application tends to spawn uh, ever more sophisticated and, and fast-moving problems. And, um, uh, and, and so, you know, we're kind of reaching a point where, where every day is, is half time at the World Cup. Now, where the, you know, a pick two trade off is not literally, okay, you can have that one and that one, and then you don't get any of the, of the third one. Um, these are all, you know, kind of adjustable trade offs. As you get it, you know, you push a little bit harder on the sophistication of your application, uh, you know, you get a little bit less quality, a little bit more problems. And kind of the, the coefficient of where those things trade off against one another uh, and, and to what degree they trade off has a lot to do with the tools you're using, uh, in particular the observability tools, which are what are going to allow you, to, uh, you know, to, to deal with these problems as they arise. And um, you know, a, a good tool can help by, um, uh, first of all, hopefully a lot, when you have a problem, helping you to, to track down and fix that problem faster. Uh, so, you know, that directly affects your, your mean time to resolution. Maybe you have just as many problems, but the aggregate amount of harm they cause is less because you're, you're stomping them out more quickly. Um, ideally, good tools can, can actually give you the visibility to, uh, to spot pro impending problems. You know, notice that that queue is filling up but is not yet full uh, and is not yet affecting customers. But, you know, if you can spot it at that point, then you can do something about it. Um, and you have no mean time to recovery because uh, you know, there's, you've recovered before you, you ever had the problem. Um, and so, you know, again, better tools can uh, you know, influence the, 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 you know, kind of the coefficient on each of those things uh, and help you, you know, maintain quality while, while your systems continue to get more, more sophisticated and, uh, and, and fast moving. Now, for that to really work, or at least to get the, the maximum advantage from your observability tools, uh, you, need, you need to get everything out of them you can. Uh, and one big part of that is there are a lot of different kinds of data that we work with that can, can shed light on a problem, can help you uh, track down a, a problem uh, more quickly. There are logs and metrics and distributed traces and network monitoring data and you know, lots of different kinds of information. Uh, you know, some of it's sort of textual, some of it's sort of structured, some of it's basically numeric. Um, you know, probably managed and uh, you know, comes from different places, but each uh, helping to, to create its part of the picture uh, of this system whose behavior you need to, to understand. You also uh, need to be able to view this data from as many angles as possible. Um, it's important to have a, a very tight real-time view, uh, so when you're troubleshooting, reacting to something that's happening in this moment, um, that uh, you know, you're able to you know, see that up to the, up to the moment picture of the, of the system that you're trying to influence. Um, as well as have a, a good historical view. So the, this problem that I'm experiencing, how long has it been going on? Did it you know, kind of creep up or did it just pop out of nowhere? Has it happened before? How often has it happened? 
Um, there are kind of different levels of focus, uh, you know, deep dive into one container or server um, or application instance to, you know, if it looks like there's something that's going on that's sort of local within that node, uh, but also, you know, take a step back, look at an entire service, an entire cluster or data center uh, if you, you know, suspect a systemic issue. And just generally, uh, you know, it's important to be able to slice and dice and, and analyze uh, all this data from a lot of different angles because problems come from a, a lot of different angles. Um, maybe a, a little bit less obviously, um, it's also very important that uh, for, for a tool to really be useful, it has to be practical to use. It has to be something that your team actually will make use of because, uh, you know, we all have a lot of tools in our toolkit where that's not necessarily the case and, uh, you know, maybe just gather dust most of the time or are only used by one or two people within the team who happen to become the, the experts on that tool, uh, which really limits the value. Um, so, uh, you know, I talked about real time a moment ago. Um, there are, you know, some tools struggle with ingestion. Uh, they may take several minutes from when an event occurs until it shows up in that tool. Um, and that's really painful, especially when you are in, in firefighting mode, when you're, uh, you know, which is a, is a, lo a feedback loop. You, you observe a problem, you react to it by making some change in your system, restart a server, change a configuration, whatever. Uh, and then you're going to observe again. Did that help? What effect did that have? Uh, you may be iterating a number of times, and if you're, if you're pausing for three minutes every time around that loop to wait for the data that reflects your new tweak to the system to show up, it's uh, really painful. Um, it's also just important that tools be easy to use. And, you know, I think sometimes as engineers we, we lose sight of this, like, you know, we're engineers, we're tough, we can, you know, do, like, I learned Linux, I learned this, I can deal with, you know, some search tool or whatever. Um, and there's, of course, some truth to that, but, um, but people will limit the kind of uh, toolkit that they give themselves when, uh, when those individual tools are, are difficult to use, especially uh, it's important to remember or to realize uh, that with uh, all the move to DevOps, um, a lot of the people, probably most of the people who are getting involved in tracking down production issues or you know, dealing with, dealing with uh, problems in their running applications, um, that's sort of their side job. You know, the, the bulk of their focus is on coding, development, creating products, and they, they get pulled into, uh, pulled into, into uh, production problems because that's, you know, that's an important part of the job. Um, but that's something they're dipping in and out of. It's not where they spend most of their time and energy. And they're unlikely to invest the, the energy in becoming an expert in a complicated tool. And if you give them something that's difficult to use, they may have to use it because that's part of the job, but they'll, they'll find two or three little features that they'll like, allow them to, to get a little bit of something done and they'll sort of gravitate onto that uh, and probably never go beyond it. And most of the value in the tool becomes wasted. Um, and, and finally, um, you know, it's important that the tool be able to scale. Uh, you know, web scale systems nowadays generate, you know, this observability data that we're working with can be massive, many, many terabytes uh, per day uh, of data. And, um, uh, and if a tool can't, you know, can't scale to work with that, uh, then it's going to fall down and, and again, people are going to wind up just not really using it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, w I, I was faced with this. Um, Bad, while I was still at Google, this was back in 2008, I'd wound up uh, on a kind of infrastructure project that was supporting Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Photos, a few other applications. Um, it was a, you know, kind of in the spirit of this talk, it was a, a big complex project uh, that interacted with a lot of other components. And, um, and so there were a lot of places for, for problems to arise. And um, Google in, internally had um, a very powerful uh, observability toolkit but it was spread across 17 different tools and no one on the team could be bothered to, to learn to use all of those tools and many of them had some of the problems I've been you know, hinting at where the, you know, they would struggle with performance um, or you know, had various other issues that would steer people away from really investing themselves in them. Uh, ironically, the, the, the weak link in the entire toolkit was the search engine for working with logs. We, we really didn't have anything deserving of the name. Um, and, and you know, we would constantly complain about it. Here we are working at Google and we can't search our logs. Um, but it was, it was really the case and it, and it, uh, it was very crippling in our ability to, to react to problems as they came up. Um, and, uh, and the upshot was that as a, as a development team, we were spending close to, our, to half of our time just, uh, just troubleshooting issues and tracking down why, you know, why is this going on. 
at Scalar, we, um, uh, we did a survey to see uh, you know, how, how widespread these kinds of problems were in, in industry. Um, we found a bunch of interesting, uh, interesting stuff, um, of which I'll, I'll just highlight uh, two facts, one of which is a, a huge number of engineers. And again, I'm not talking about you know, operations team or SRE here. This is, we were you know, surveying engineers broadly, um, you know, including you know, development teams and so forth. Um, a huge proportion of those people spend a huge proportion, often even the, the majority of their time, not coding, not developing, but troubleshooting. And, um, and in many cases, all, uh, the majority of that troubleshooting time is actually just spent sitting and, and waiting for a, a query to come back. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the log query is, is the new, you know, I'm waiting for a compile. Um, so we built Scalar to uh, specific, directly to, to address this challenge. Um, so we're, we're a, a hosted log management service. And, um, and the, the philosophy of what we built um, is specifically to, to address these, these challenges that, uh, that I've been talking about. Um, to, uh, you know, to create a system that's, um, uh, that's, you know, that's fast, uh, easy to use, scalable, kind of applicable, you know, widely applicable to a, a broad range of use cases, uh, is, is fast uh, and is fast. And uh, I, I harp on fast, I harp on speed because that really underlies uh, most of the other attributes. Uh, a slow system is not going to be easy to use, it's not going to be scalable, uh, it's not going to be applicable to the, all the different situations uh, where, where you need to use it. And um, so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to uh, kind of dive into, you know, what, what did it take to build this system? Uh, you, know, what are the, you know, what are some of the engineering challenges? You know, what does that look like as an engineering problem? And, and what are some of the things that, uh, that we did to address that? So, so let's review, you know, why this is a, a hard problem. And um, so if we, you know, think about, think about the task. Um, you know, we're here to support engineers who are troubleshooting uh, problems that are arising in their system. And, and problems come in all shapes and sizes, uh, and they arise in systems of, of all shapes and sizes. So it's, it's a big data problem in the sense that the data is big. You know, we have, you know, we may have, you know, again, terabytes of, of you know, logs and other kinds of, of information that we're working with. But it has a somewhat different flavor than a lot of other big data problems because it, it's not amenable to scheduled reports. It's not amenable, the queries, uh, you know, kind of come at unpredictable times or the questions you need to ask come up at unpredictable times. And every question is different. So it's not really amenable to defining like a special data layout or a special index setup, you know, that, you know, optimizes for your exact query because every query is different and, and there's not even much of a schema to this data to, to kind of build from. And so, you know, we're taking these huge data sets. Uh, we want to run sort of any kind of a query. We don't have much of a schema to work with. Uh, and we'd like to give uh, answers at interactive speed, uh, in like in less than one second. Um, so, you know, may, may, maybe that's a little bit difficult. The traditional approach, um, in particular for, for log management, is to use a, a keyword index. Um, and, and this is sort of, you know, it seems like a very obvious and reasonable thing to do. Logs are text. We are pretty much searching through that text. How do we search text? With a, a keyword index. You know, this tried and true technology, it powers web search, it powers product search on any e-commerce you know, e site. Um, you know, it goes all the way back to the, the printed index in the, in the back of a, a reference book. And, um, you know, it obviously has you know, served a lot of those applications very well. Uh, I'm going to just very, very briefly review to kind of freshen in our minds how a keyword index works. Um, you have some corpus of documents you're working with, a set of web pages, or in our case, a set of log messages. And um, you're going to find the vocabulary, all of the unique words that appear at least once somewhere in all of that. Um, and for each, each one of those words, you're going to make a list of all the places it shows up. And then when you do a search, uh, you can just sort of consult that, that index. If I'm searching for, uh, you know, for a certain word, I just look in the index under that word, and I find all the places that that word appears. Um, and again, you know, this is, approach has been used for a long time. It's been, you know, very optim well optimized and, uh, you know, there's some very sophisticated implementations out there. Um, and they're optimized for the kind of typical attributes, uh, you know, of these applications where it's been used. Uh, where usually you're looking for like a best 10 matches, you know, show me the best 10 web pages on this topic. 
Uh, you're working with a human language corpus where that vocabulary might be a few tens of thousands of words, you know, the same words used over and over and over and over again. You've got relatively large individual documents that you're working with, a, you know, a web page or a product write-up or something. Um, those documents live for a, a fair while before they're updated or replaced by new documents. Uh, and the queries usually are keyword-based, you know, show me everything relevant to, to this three-word phrase. But none of these, you know, all of that turns upside down in a log management application. Um, there's, it's never a best 10 problem. There's no show me the best 10 times my server crashed. Uh, whatever you're looking for, you want to find all of it, every access to this system, every time this error occurred, and create some kind of a summary, a graph, or some other visualization. Um, uh, along with kind of, you know, real words in there, there are record IDs and IP addresses and, and floating point numbers and all kinds of garbage. So when you're breaking the text up into units, there may be, instead of tens of thousands of unique terms, there may be hundreds of millions of unique terms. Uh, the documents, the units we look for are individual log messages, uh, one line of text, so they're tiny and there are billions or trillions of them. Um, they don't live very long, you know, you know, every second millions of new messages may be arriving. Uh, and the, the searches sometimes are kind of keyword based, but sometimes it's a regular expression or, or a numeric range, like show me all the times that this service took more than one second to respond, meaning it took 1,000 milliseconds or 1,001 milliseconds or 1,002 milliseconds. You know, in kind of keyword terms, it's, it, it, you know, it's not really a keyword query. Um, and so all of the optimization and sophistication that has gone into keyword indexes you know, really doesn't help and, and really gets in the way. So we've taken a, a very different approach. Um, the, the simplistic version of, uh, simplistic description of what we've built, um, it's, it's basically a, a column-oriented data store. So we, and what I mean by that is we, is we're receiving logs in real time. Log data is streaming in from somewhere. Um, and just for, for illustration, let's say it's a web access log. Um, and so each message consists of an IP address and then a timestamp and then a, a, you know, the method name, get or post, uh, and the URL and so forth. Um, there's a, a you know, reasonably regular structure. Um, as the logs come in, we break each message up on those units uh, and then we store that in a columnar arrangement on disk. So all the IP addresses go into one chunk of disk, all of the timestamps go to a second chunk on disk and so forth. But we're not doing much transformation. We're not building an index. We're, we're just taking the, the, the text, breaking it up into those pieces, and dumping it on disk. Uh, and when it's time to do a search, we, um, uh, or to execute a query, we just scan the data. And depending on the nature of the query, we might have to scan the entire log, uh, but often we can get away with just scanning a particular column. Like if someone asks us something about all the references for a particular URL, then we can just scan the URL column, and we have a lot less data to look at. And what's great about this is it's, uh, first of all, it's very flexible. You know, a lot of different queries, you know, we don't have to worry about, well, this query is a good match for the index, but that query isn't, because um, there's no index. Um, you know, so we're very flexible in the kinds of queries that we can execute. But maybe even more important, it's, it's very simple, simple enough that we're able to build it from the ground up um, ourselves, and, you know, every little coding decision along the way was optimized for the, for the use cases and, and data patterns that you, that you see in these kinds of applications. And to illustrate the importance of that, um, think about, you know, old timers like me like to complain about how, you know, my Commodore PET back in 1981 booted up faster than, you know, my Mac or Windows laptop today, uh, even though the processor today is something like 50,000 times more powerful. Uh, and it's true, like, you know, some of those early machines would boot up more or less instantaneously. And the reason is the modern machines are layered down and weighted down with so much more software. Now there's a lot of value there. Uh, I'm not going to trade back, but um, but that value comes at a cost. And if you don't need the value, if you don't need all of the stuff that this you know modern super sophisticated code base is giving you, then you're paying a lot of performance tax and, and not getting any benefit from it. And um, so this you know very streamlined uh, engine that we've built, that kind of only good at one thing, but it's uh, hopefully very good at that thing can scan data, this is how we think about the performance, it can scan data at about one gigabyte per second per CPU core in our backend system. So each processor core on our search cluster, when it's executing a query, can plow through about one gigabyte per second uh, in this data store. And that's all in with all of the overhead, you know, it's a real world measurement, not just an inner loop measurement, because there's not much distance between the inner loop 
and the complete system. That's sort of the point of uh, you know, building it from scratch. Um, the other key thing we've done is to throw massive parallelism at the problem, basically take advantage of the economy of scale of a centrally hosted service. So um, uh, when, when one of our users, uh, you know, any individual engineer, uh, one of our customers uh, executes a query or requests a query, every CPU core on every server in our cluster um, is, uh, immediately jumps on that. The data is distributed in a way where each, each uh, server and within each server, each CPU core is able to work with its fair share of the data. Um, and so our aggregate search performance today is about 1.5 terabytes per second. Uh, and that's just that one gigabyte per second number I mentioned a moment ago, multiplied by the, the current size of our search cluster. Um, so rather than you know, kind of having a lot of things going on at the same time, and we're running this query, and we're running that query, and we're giving, you know, they're each kind of plotting along, we just slam out one at a time, devote the entire cluster to one query, get it done out of the system, and move on to the next one. And the kind of the, the mathematics of the system work out that, you know, the concern there would be if you're waiting in line, but there's actually uh, so much horsepower available that the system is usually idle. Uh, and, you know, if, you know, by the time someone gets their, you know, one of our users somewhere in the world gets their finger all the way down to the, the mouse or keyboard button and clicks off that uh, a query, you know, nine times out of ten, we've already finished whatever other query we were working on previously. Um, you know, maybe the intuition of it is we're not doing any more work than we would be doing if we ran lots of stuff in parallel. We're just reordering that work to get one query done before we move on to the next one. Um, and I'll just mention briefly, you know, obviously there's you know, lots, of, lots of fun stuff that I'm not going to have time to talk about, but I'll mention briefly the system I've just described is optimized for running one query at a time, which means it works well when queries don't come in too frequently. Um, you know, we serve our customers' engineering teams. We don't serve our customers' users. We're not, when, you know, if one of our customers is an e-commerce site, we don't get involved every time someone does a product search. Um, so, you know, we're working with sort of low cardinality operations, and they, you know, they come in kind of one at a time. Each one has high value. There's a lot of data to be searched. It's very important. But, you know, individual human beings in relatively limited quantities are generating those, and that's, that's why this, the, the system works. But there are other aspects of uh, any observability picture that can generate a lot more queries. Um, for example, uh, a dashboard. You might have a, a dashboard you set up that has 30 graphs on it. So to render that dashboard is going to require executing 30 queries. Uh, you might have it up on a, on a wall where it's constantly refreshing. So suddenly you've got this ongoing high, you know, stream of queries coming through 24 hours a day and multiply that by you know, every wall at every one of our customers around the world. Another example is alerting rules. Um, as we have customers who have defined thousands of alerting rules uh, looking for patterns in their logs, we evaluate each one of those rules uh, once per minute. So that's, you know, again, you know, in aggregate adds up to uh, probably hundreds of queries per second, 24 hours a day. So that's not a fit for the model I've been describing. Uh, but the nice thing about this is all of these queries are repetitive. It's the same set of queries over and over and over again. And so we've built uh, a second uh, backend that's optimized for those queries. In, in database terms, we create a materialized view for each one of those repetitive queries. Um, so when the query comes in, uh, it's time to evaluate this alerting rule, we don't actually have any work to do. We already know the answer. We've pre-materialized it. Um, and the, the interesting part of that is, is building an engine that, as logs are arriving in real time, can continuously update all of those materialized views. Um, we built a system around a sort of dis creates a decision tree, so it can quickly evaluate for each new log event. Uh, you know, is it relevant to any of these standing queries? Um, so, but, you know, back to that 1.5 terabytes per second figure I mentioned. You know, that relates to how the, the size of our system. And uh, so, this is a graph that's showing what that performance uh, benchmark has, has looked like over time. So, uh, a few years ago, um, I wrote a blog post describing uh, a lot of this architecture. Uh, the title was 20 gigabytes per second, uh, which was the performance of our system at that time and, and was something we felt very proud of at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, gone way, way up from there, and every quarter it increases just as a natural byproduct of, uh, of how we scale, you know, as we, as we add customers and, and add to our back-end system. And um, this leads to a bunch of stuff that, uh, that I'm just really happy, happy about and, and, and proud of. Um, you know, I've talked about the you know, 1.5 terabyte per second performance that we're at today. 
Um, maybe, and kind of more important, you know, what that leads to is that 96% of the queries our users hand us complete in less than one second. And that's that interactive interactivity that I was talking about that, that will draw people into a tool and get them to actually use it, uh, which they do. Um, you know, across, you know, say some of our larger customers that might have, you know, a few thousand engineers in the system, 50% um, of those will be active in the tool every week and 25% every day. And again, this is not an SRE team. This is an entire engineering team. Um, and is, you know, often, you know, very high level of engagement for, for a tool like this. Um, so now I, um, I want to give you just a, a brief demo uh, of the product just to, you know, maybe kind of make a little bit more concrete some of what I've been talking about of, you know, the, the experience, uh, you know, that, that can help make a tool more, more accessible to a team. I'm not going to make this into a sales pitch. I'm just going to, you know, kind of very briefly show you a flavor of, of what all this looks like. And, um, and to do that, I'm just going to talk through um, very briefly a, a simple scenario of, a, of an engineer uh, trying to track down a problem. Um, so we're looking here at a, kind of an overview dashboard for a, for a collection of web servers. Um, just a, you know, basic statistics, uh, you know, amount of traffic into the system, how that breaks down in, into different status codes and so forth. Uh, this particular graph is showing the response time, how long it takes uh, the, the web servers to process any given request. And we can see we've got these spikes, uh, which uh, imply some kind of an intermittent performance issue. Um, so I'm going to drill down on that. And, um, and I'm going to, you know, the, the, one of the, these plots is the 99th percentile time, uh, and it's sort of crushing the graph and making it hard to see the rest of it. So I'll, I'll turn that off, uh, and then if I turn off the mean as well and look just at the median, the, um, uh, the spikes are gone. I can't see where they were. So that tells me that my performance issue is affecting less than half of my traffic. It's not a completely systemic issue. It's, it's affecting some subset. Um, so to explore that, uh, I'm going to bring up a histogram of the, the time field, the, the, the y-axis on this graph. And I can see that uh, most of the requests are completing in less than 50 milliseconds. Uh, in fact, a, a lot of them in just two milliseconds. But there's this long tail way out past 10 seconds. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it's, it's a good guess that that long tail is where the problem is com coming in. So I'm going to add a term to my query uh, to show only requests that took at least one second uh, and click update. Uh, and flip to the, the raw log view. So this is the same data we've been looking at all along, but we're finally seeing it in its raw form. Um, so we've got a bunch of requests, each of which took more than one second because that's, that was the filter that I applied. Um, and I've got a bunch of different tools now for um, kind of ex exploring, exploring uh, this uh, you know, from different angles, as I talked about. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a particular one, uh, which is uh, these logs incorporate a trace ID uh, that shows, you know, kind of identifies each request as it flows through the system. I'm going to click on one of those trace IDs and run a new search just across all, a very simple query, all servers, all logs, show me everywhere that trace ID appeared. Um, and I can see, um, you know, a fair number of steps occurred. And there was a funny error message that popped up along the way. Um, and, um, you know, maybe, so, you know, now I'm going to ask myself the question, well, is that error message my whole problem is that what's going on in all these slow requests, or is it just some little fluke? Uh, well, let's find out. Let's do a new search for that. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, that, that message is showing up a lot, and it's clustered in time in a pattern that, uh, that matches the original performance problem that I was seeing. And so now, just by kind of drilling her down and exploring a little bit, um, I've got a pretty good idea that uh, if I go search my source code and figure out you know, where this error message uh, originates, uh, I may have a window into the performance problem. Um, and the point, uh, you know, that I try to draw from all of this is, um, you know, kind of illustrating some of what I was talking, talking about earlier. Um, you know, in that quick little one or two minute uh, dive uh, through that troubleshooting scenario, I pulled up a bunch of different visualizations. I, you know, kind of looked at the data from a number of different angles. I, you know, pivoted from, a, you know, from a, a latency measurement to an error message. And, um, and the fact that I was able to do that without sort of interrupting my flow state, without having to jump from tool to tool, without having to wait for a query to come back and, well, maybe I better check my email, um, I was able to just sort of stay in the flow. And that's, um, you know, I think very important for that. You know, it's maybe another way of crystallizing what we, what we try to do uh, here at Scalar and, and I think is important in general 
uh, you know, whether you know, scalar is in the picture or not, but you know, as the world gets more and more complex, as we leverage all these modern tools to you know, pile more sophistication into what we build, it's important to have these tools that you know, let, your, let your team stay in that flow state. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you for listening. Um, you know, just to kind of in summary, you know, another way I, I think to think about everything I've been saying is about questioning assumptions. Uh, you know, as, you know, again, you know, the cloud and, and microservices and, and Kubernetes and all these new techniques flow into our toolkits, uh, the world changes and we have to keep re-examining the way we do things and the, the choices we make as, as how we go about that. Um, you know, everything from how we architect our systems to how we, uh, you know, how we, you know, in this case, how we think about observability, how we might implement, you know, is a keyword index still the right technology? You know, these are specific examples. Uh, but, you know, I think maybe the, the real point is that, um, you know, we do need to take a step back from time to time and question our assumptions about how we're doing things because what really made sense five or ten years ago uh, may not may not make much sense uh, anymore. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop uh, and uh, take a few questions. We've got time for a few questions, but also happy to, uh, you know, if you'd like to hear more about this or, uh, or just take a look at the product, um, we're uh, over in the hall at, at booth 201. Thank you. So if you have a question, uh, I have no idea what you should do, but I see something that might be a microphone stand over there. Or just project. Well, I can hear you and I'll repeat. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, uh, you know, so there's this proprietary system uh, that generates its own kind of log format that involves multiple, you know, multi-line units. Uh, you know, one logical event is, is multiple lines of text. And, you know, can we work with that? Um, and so the, the short answer is yes. Um, um, so we have, there's a whole, uh, you know, yeah, I didn't dive into this because I didn't want to turn it into a product pitch, but we have a whole kind of what we call our parsing engine uh, that has a bunch of tools, including the ability to, you know, group lines together, uh, and then uh, pretty sophisticated at being able to reach in. And, you know, I would like to boast, I, I think this is still close to literally true, that, you know, we've never come across a, a text format we haven't been able to work with. There's a little bit of a cheat because sometimes we sneak behind the scenes and extend the toolkit a little bit. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've, we've, we've worked with uh, lots of stuff like that. We've got five more minutes, so don't be shy. Uh, yes? So as you see, do you see this as replacing a relational database model more broadly over time? So do we see this as replacing uh, relational database models uh, more broadly? Uh, in general, no. Uh, maybe in some specific instances. Uh, you know, I think the, the technique, you know, this overall approach we've described, we don't build indexes, columnar layout, kind of, you know, parallelism one query at a time, works really well when you have a relatively low rate of queries and the queries are hard to really optimize for because they're ad hoc and come in different shapes and sizes and so forth. Um, and that certainly comes up in a lot of other domains besides uh, log management or operational visibility. Uh, but most problems miss on one or more of those checkboxes. But, uh, but when you do have that shape, you know, it's ad hoc queries, hard to optimize for, and um, you're kind of using it, you know, one, one query per second as opposed to a thousand queries per second to service your, your flood of uh, B2C customers. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of, you know, if you, if you have those two ingredients, then I think this can work well. Well, um, 
you know, if there are no other questions right now, then, uh, you know, again, thank you. And, um, you know, I'll hang around for a few minutes uh, down here. Uh, and otherwise, uh, come find us at Booth 201. Thank you.